Hey, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, here's lecture uh, 7A. This is on populism. It, it really happened during the Gilded Age and reaction to the Gilded Age, but so important as it was the foundation for progressivism. Okay, the big cause of this was the Gilded Age, and, and it's really the, the populist movement was in the rural areas uh, west of the Mississippi in the south where farming was the huge deal. And it revolved around uh, industrialization, specifically the railroads uh, colliding with the farmers. Uh, to get the with the new inventions uh, of technology uh, for farmers to get these, they needed the railroad. Uh, they would usually mortgage their land if they had land to buy these things and thus expected crops to pay that back. But money was short in, was short in supply, and we'll talk about that and really because we were on the gold standard. Okay, so money was backed by gold. Gold, there's not an unlimited supply, and so. Less money means that uh, prices for crops is less, which makes it harder for these farmers to pay back. This can't totally be blamed on railroads and industrialization. Uh, there was also this problem with farming. Uh, the price of farm products declined as, as there was more farmers. For instance, cotton during the Civil War, uh, European countries looked elsewhere, India uh, for, for cotton. And so there was a saturation in the market of this. Uh, and so the price of these products declined, yet that means that farmers' earnings decline, which means they can't pay back these loans. And then banks are going to lend less and less money to these farmers because they don't get their money back. And so it's this this idea and farmers are looking at people to blame and it's these railroads and there's not a whole lot of uh, competition amongst railroads to set prices lower for transportation of these goods. And so it's the easy person to blame. And so uh, big business banking is going to be where the farmers biggest concerns are. Okay, so and, and it started and it was a grassroots movement. One of the reasons it wasn't super successful at the federal level, but at the local level, we got the Granges. We've seen Granges and, and you've probably driven past ones in this area. Uh, they were able to come together and, and fight uh, for regulation of these businesses that farmers depended on. Uh, they were able to buy goods at uh, lower prices as they came together. Uh, it really does good. You, it kind of is the idea, you'll see it, um, I guess, in southeast Washington where I grew up. You have uh, these grain bins where everyone takes their grain and stores there. And then whatever it's sold for, they get, you know, and you put X amount in, this is the price you're going to get for it at that time. And then other people sell it. So it really helps farmers uh, that are dependent on the sale of their uh, product to survive. Um, and so this goes from the idea of the Grange to the Farmers Alliances. It should be known that uh, blacks weren't allowed to be a part of many of these Farmers Alliances, especially in the South. So they made their own. Uh, the Colored Farmers Alliance we'll see uh, during this time. And they were fighting for women's rights, which uh, won popularity. Now, the problem, though, is they also need to win popularity, not just from the farmers, but uh, industries. And they will, especially in the West, where they'll get uh, miners and, and different uh, industry like that behind them. Uh, but really for them to have a lot of success, they really needed to get unions on their side. They really needed to get the factories, factory workers. And that's just not going to be the case. But they will form the populist party and, and their platform will be a platform that progressives will take and use down the road. There will be some reactions to this, and, and we need to know these because these kind of build into uh, the progressive movement. You get the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, baby, basically able to regulate aspects of interstate commerce, which are the railroads, okay, going from state to state. So it will help uh, control prices, help farmers out there. You also get the Sherman Antitrust Act, which will prohibit monopolies, but they're not enforced. Both are ineffectively uh, enforced, which makes them inefficient uh, to really, really help and get a lot of things done. But it is a step in the right direction, or as we'd say, progress. Okay, and so at the federal level, you do get the Populist Party or the People's Party, and, and you get this platform. And this platform, you'll see many things that you'll see progressives fight for in the early 1900s, from 1900 to 1920. 
Okay, and so they want uh, women's suffrage, a direct election of U.S. senators, the idea of a secret ballot, term limits in Congress. Uh, they they want government ownership of railroads and telephone companies to control those prices. Okay, to help farmers out, an income tax, initiatives and referendums to really let the people have a voice, and they were also uh, nativist in ways. They wanted uh, restrictions on undesirable immigration. They felt taking their jobs. This party will continually to grow in 1892 and really hit the high point uh, in the midterm elections of 1894 and then uh, basically become a part of the Democratic Party in 1896. As you can see in the presidential election of 1892, where we have Cleveland who will win uh, the election, uh, you do see a growth in the populist movement. And this will continue to grow because of the Panic of 1893. But in the election of 1892, you get Grover Cleveland winning. Now, he's one of the only presidents to win and not back-to-back -back terms. He comes into the office. A uh, small fact about him is that he married in the White House, only president to marry in the White House, uh, a woman who was 21 years old, 27 years younger than him. OK, but he wins. And what he doesn't do is he doesn't handle the panic of 1893 very well. OK, doesn't handle this uh, panic very well. There are numerous uh, corporations that go bankrupt, causes the stock market to crash, kind of giving a preview of the Great Depression for us. And, and a lot of this these overextended investments, making banks fail. Banks fail and they ask for their money back Okay, or, or trying to get those loans back. Unemployment is huge and the federal government does nothing. This gives a lot of credibility to the populist party. One of the – and this is a great uh, picture, you know, the debt on these labors, the mortgages, the having to sell their house, okay? Here uh, lies prosperity, enslaved in 1863, stabbed in the back in 1873, and assassinated in 1893, okay? Talking about those depressions, recessions during that time, time excuse me, Okay. And one of the sayings during this time, when the banker says he's broke and the merchant's up in smoke, they forgot that it's the farmer who feeds them all. It'd be put, it would put them to the test if the farmer took a rest. They'd know that it's the farmer that feeds them all. This idea that, that we cannot go on without the farmer, the backbone of the United States. With the uh, Depression of 1893, you get an interesting um, movement. Okay, that helps this populist movement, and it's the Coxey's Army. Okay, they marched to Washington, D.C. They basically wanted the government to pay the unemployed by putting them to work, basically, and an early idea of welfare. Coxey, who leads it, marches to Washington, D.C. He's arrested before he gives this speech, but it gives you a good idea of where people are. They want the government to do something. They want the government to help. They want the government to help the small person, the farmer, the uh, factory worker. Okay, And so this will be a rise in the populist party. Now, with this rise... You get the election of 1896, and one of the big issues will be should we stay on the gold standard? Now, this is something that's not new to America, but it will be heavily seen at this time. And so you get big business wanting to stay on gold, okay? Staying on gold results in less money. It's more stable, okay? It allows for us to be stable in international trade. It makes the value of the dollar high. It keeps prices uh, for goods low. Okay, and, and so this is important. Farmers and those people who take out loans want more money. And by doing this, because gold, remember, there's not unlimited. There's a limited amount of gold. The silverites or people who wanted to use other precious metals – specifically silver, wanted more of this. This would increase money supply. With more money supply, the value of the dollar drops, although your loan is still this equals the same, but the value drops. There's more money, which is inflation, which causes prices to rise. So farmers would get more money 
for their crops, meaning they'd have more in their pockets. They could pay back those loans that are set at a certain dollar amount. Okay, And so this is something that the Populist Party really wants. And in the election of 1896, it will become a huge thing. And the gentleman running is William Jennings Bryan. You might know him from our imperialism talks. He's going to run three elections as president. He's going to lose them all. He's going to run as the uh, Populist Party, but he's he's going to be a, a Democrat. And, and Understand that he goes to the Democratic Convention. The Populist Party knows that uh, they won't be able to win without being on a major ticket. Okay, And so this allows him to do this. And he gives this famous speech, this cross of gold speech at the Democratic uh, Convention to really solidify him as the, the candidate for that election. And it kind of uh, – a line in it. And he, you got to imagine him standing up there and, and acting this way. They tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that our great cities rest upon our broad and great prairies. Burn down our cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city of the country. You shall not, and you got to imagine him standing on in front of everyone in the Democratic you shall not press down the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Okay, he gives this speech, and it's speaking to the common man. Okay, he really believes in the, uh, this, uh, this idea of social gospel too, helping help government, helping uh, those who need it. And because he's part of the Democratic Party, this is going to be one of our modern elections, the Republican Party big business because they're scared of getting off the gold, raises a lot of money for McKinley. Brian doesn't have as much, but he does travel a lot. And so it is very, very close. Popular vote, not the electoral vote. And McKinley, McKinley excuse me, will win. Okay, and so that will end, effectively end the populist party. So both the Democrats and populists nominated him as uh, uh, president. Uh, so he kind of – the populist party is added into the Democratic Party. McKinley defeats Bryan, keeps the Gold Standard Act. Uh, it's a victory for uh, conservatives. This is where we kind of see the Republican Party uh, that we'll get later, and it will end the po populist movement. I will put this in the link, but – in the, uh, I believe it was 1900, the book The Wonderful Wizard of Oz came out, and people think it's an analogy to the populist movement. They see the Wizard of Oz ounces, uh, the Wizard of Oz in the Emerald of Green, the Green City, Emerald City, all green, money, okay, big business, Wizard of Oz, uh, McKinley who won uh, the Yellow Brick Road gold, gold standard into the Emerald City. Okay, uh, the uh, wicked witches, industry, banks. Okay, and so I'm going to put a link to a article about that if you'd like in the you in the comment section. So, have a wonderful weekend. Hope you enjoy this. Adios.